Welcome to the Distinguished Lecturer Series um, of Castell. So many of you are here actually for the, um, the Stammvorlesung, but we have neatly aligned this with um, the, the guest lecture of our, our guest, Lorenzo Cavallaro. And I had uh, the great pleasure to, to invite him here over to, to Karlsruhe and KIT in the name of, um, on the one hand side, the KIT Graduate School for Cybersecurity and also um, Castell's Security Research um, Labs. And we are jointly um, bringing you this, this nice um, guest lecture. So as mentioned, um, we have Lorenzo Cavallaro here who has been finishing his PhD in 2008 in, from University of Milan, then spent a couple of years as a postdoc at the um, UC Santa Barbara and Freie Universität in, in Amsterdam before he finally um, got the lecturer position um, in, in London. And then he was progressing through the different um, steps um, of Royal Holloway up until he has received a full professorship um, in 2018, then moved to, to King's College in London, and now last year um, to the University College in, in London. And except for the, the fact that this was sort of hectic right now, I also happen to be sort of nervous because this, this feels special, um, to be honest. So um, the weird thing is that I actually don't know Laurent so that, that long, but he is good friends with my, my doctoral um, father, and I happen to be sort of good friends with one of his uh, former postdocs, and we're all doing a similar line of research, namely at the intersection of machine learning and computer security, so this sort of feels like academic family somehow. And I'm very happy that he's here today, because on the one hand side, he's a super nice person, but he is also, also doing um, very um, nice research. So um, one piece of research we are going to um, get to know about um, today, which is um, based on their um, latest um, IEEE security and privacy um, paper from this year, which also is an extension from a paper from 2017 um, at USENIC Security. And also in the meantime, there has been um, a lot of nice research, although Lorenzo is trying to be humble about this. Um, so I'm really a, a fan of, of his research. Um, anyhow, so without further ado, I would say um, let's hear about um, the research of, of Lorenzo. All right. Oh my God, that was very loud. So I guess you can hear me. And uh, um, thank you, Christian, for the, the very nice, cheesy and uh, introduction. So yes, we're like an you know, academic family. And, uh, but of course, you know, my, my fear is that Christian has set the bar too high. And I know the, you guys were lured into this room rather than enjoying the sunshine. So I hope that you're gonna have still a very great time despite my blubbling about uh, machine learning and security. And um, of course, you know, I tend to walk a lot when I talk. So Philip has kindly uh, agreed to raise his hand, not for asking question, but just to put me back in frame and in position. So if you see this weird interaction, it's all justified. Um, so if you can, if you have any questions, please uh, just feel free to interrupt me anytime. So I, I really would love this to be as interactive as possible. And it's more like, you know, um, a little bit of a journey on how we got uh, to explore some interesting research problem we find interesting. And uh, although I might not have time, you know, to tell you all the anecdotes, so, you know, that will be later for beers or, you know, for some other questions uh, just after the talk. Okay, so today, I guess the talk was advertised as uh, revisiting machine learning um, for malware classification in the presence of concept drift. And I took the liberty of changing the title, like, you know, to broaden the title a little bit, because, you know, this, this is a distinguished lecture series. So it shouldn't really be about a paper. It should be about a story. It's going to be about a paper, but it's intertwined by several different stories that we've gone through. And I wanted to set the scene a little bit more. Uh, talking about what we are up to. So we're not really at this stage chasing papers and trying to have idea based on research interest. We're trying actually to realize our research vision. And the re research vision, if you can use a buzzword, um, it's about trustworthy AI. I guess I wrote trustworthy ML because this is what we do. 
but everyone says AI. So, so there are two slightly different things, but you know, say trustworthy ML. But the point is that that differentiates our work uh, with respect to other pieces of work is that we don't really look about computer vision tasks nor uh, natural language processing per se, but we actually deal with software and systems. So everything that we've been doing and all the challenges that I would be telling you about, it's instantiated on system security. And I guess that this is a, a very interesting um, and important aspect for me because some of the questions are actually shared across um, different application domains uh, in terms of trustworthiness of machine learning systems. But other questions, and I hope that I'll be able to convey the message at, at, at the very end of the talk, other, other messages, other questions are really peculiar if you start working on systems, if you start working on software. And we're trying to understand why and whether this is the case. All right. So I guess that, you know, successes of machine learning or deep learning of AI, let's call it AI, just, you know, for being as generic as possible is undeniable. I guess, you know, you cannot go a day without reading about success stories of machine learning. I know you might question that I read weird magazines, but, you know, that's the life, you know, the, you know, between mangas and animes also, you know, some, some good research uh, doesn't hurt. So I guess one of the latest advances that you might have bumped into is called DALI, which is, I guess this was uh, realized just recently by OpenAI. Yeah, it's just a system that basically you give a description, textual description in natural language of what you would like to be depicted and the system generates an image for you, okay? And, but we've been seeing advances in the context of computer vision tasks and natural language processing now with all these large language models. Those are just, you know, um, amazing if you can, you can think about, you know, what you can achieve. Now, we've been using machine learning in security context also for pretty much, uh, I would say two to three decades. Um, first, you know, back then we didn't really call it machine learning that much. It was a lot or statistical models. Uh, in the early or late 90s, early 2000, you could see a lot of work around anomaly detection, so which basically focuses on describing normal behavior and then flagging any deviation from this normality as anomalous with the hidden assumption that anomalies were a manifestation of attacks. Turns out that is not true most of the cases uh, because it's hard to generalize and model normal data in general. So there was a little bit of, you know, roller coaster um, when applying machine learning security, but we've been doing this for, you know, at least two decades. Images question, like if you look at papers published in top tier conferences also, you know, you look at numbers, at, at, perform at performances, at performance of these machine learning models, and you can read things that are very close to 99% um, uh, of F1 scores, just, you know, very high performance uh, models. If that is the case, I would argue that the problem is solved. Like if you have something that works with a very precise matrix at 99%, you're very close to 1%, you know, 100%. It's very unlikely that you're going to get 100% because you're still dealing with statistical approaches. So I would say, you know, just a game over. Turns out that actually we're still working quite actively on this. So why? I guess, you know, the conditions haven't been there yet. And there is one specific characteristics that define our field that is inherently different from other domains. And the problem is that security is inherently adversarial. So instead of trying to introduce adversarial attacks into a problem that you need to deal with, security has to deal with this from the onset. So you cannot deploy a model that is not robust against some adversarial manipulation because the model wouldn't actually live very long. And this is where things start getting a little bit tricky because you can, of course, you know, branch off into some research area that has been known now for a decade, give it a take, known as adversarial machine learning, where it's concerned about the security of machine learning models and how spe specifically crafted perturbations can actually break the classifier's inference at testing time, talk about in inference, or the poisoning attacks at, uh, you know, training time. There is also something different that we tend to neglect. And the fact is, you know, security is adversarial. Therefore, you have to deal with threats that are evolving over time. And this evolution uh, basically um, causes a drift. If you imagine to represent your data as points that belong to a specific distribution that you might not know anything about, uh, well, the truth is that over time, 
the distribution of the object that you collected and you used to train your classifier will start drifting apart from the one of the objects that you're going to be observing in the wild. And so this is known as different terminologies depending on the community you're working with. But in our case, we can talk more generically about concept drift. The concept drift can take form of different. So there are different types of drift. You can talk about uh, covariate shift, uh, label shift, uh, concept drift per se. But you basically imagine that anything that causes a drift of this two, of this distribution, uh, it's a problem because machine learning models work with at least one assumption. And the assumption is IID. I'm sure that you guys have heard IID many times in your probability and statistical classes. You might have not taken very much attention to it. I didn't in the past because I couldn't really understand, you know, what is the ID? Yeah, everything is ID because you give a problem, say, you know, assuming ID. Okay, I'm assuming ID. What does it mean? It means that the training, sorry, it means that the point that you use to train your model and the one that you use for testing your model are drawn from the same distribution. So training set and testing set are identically and independently distributed. Um, in real life, this doesn't happen because threats evolves and threats that you present in a specific way evolves all the time. Not only this, um, there is something also different in security that you need to understand how you want to represent the objects that you're going to work with. So take the example, for instance, of images. So our definition, I'm not talking about image classification here, really, but, you know, about the definition of behavior, something that we do know how to describe. So our definition of a rabbit, for instance, wouldn't change over time. Well, at least maybe it would change like in, you know, give or take millions of years, uh, but it wouldn't change it so rapidly to experience any drift in the concept that they were trying to express. Now, of course, security is slightly different. So let's assume, and this is a, an artificial example, just, you know, to try to set the scene. Let's assume that there is a very specific point in time to which the only threat that you have to deal with is ad fraud. Okay? So you collect data about ad fraud, you find a way to represent this data. So what's known as feature engineering. Um, you represent the, the data in a specific form. You train your classifier. And then at a certain point, you deploy your classifier and you observe testing objects that will belong to ad fraud. Now, if this process is done correctly, you'll be able to detect ad frauds one way or another. Now, the problem is that attackers would react to this system. And I will actually try to understand, you know, okay, we can no longer use ad frauds to uh, monetize malicious software. So what can we do? Um, well, maybe we can now move on ransomware. And at that point, they start developing a new threat that would be, you know, infecting systems. And at that point, the system that you have trained on ad fraud would not behave as expected on ransomware because the two objects you're looking at are different. They do not share any behavior. And the representation that you use, so the way that you chose to describe these objects is very much different. So what you do, you collect data now here, you train now the system use, including ransomware as well, you deploy the system and you back and forth again, you know. So it looks like, you know, a, a cat and mouse game. Um, there is another problem here. So this is a very artificial and toy example, of course. Uh, but there is another problem here. And the problem is that we are kind of, you know, far away from by the way, I should have said, you know, that you should have had a nicer animation here, uh, but we had to, for technological uh, compliance, we had to export in PDF, so you lose all the animation. So, um, but anyway, so the problem is that we are far away to what we de describe as a platonic ideal of semantics. So if we could describe behavior in a specific and unique way, then you, we would be able to at least identify that sort of behavior. The problem is that we don't really know yet how to describe a behavior. There are different ways in which you could do it. There are different abstractions you can use it. There are different um, approximations that you can use it. But this means that you're choosing a specific representation for an object. And I know this is a little bit abstract still at this stage. So I'll try to make it clear as we move along. Um, but this behavior, this choose these choices of abstractions will have an implication on the robustness of the classifier to drift to adversarial manipulation to explainability and to performance. 
performance in the normal settings. So we're quite far now from understanding this platonic idea of behavior. So we need to live with approximations and behavior. So what I believe we need is we need really, so as an overarching thing, we need really to understand and improve effectiveness, effectiveness of machine learning models for system security in the presence of adversaries. So it is not possible to reason about these things independently. We need to absolutely reason about their intertwined relationship. And here, one key point, if you think about software, is about the role of representations. They used to represent objects, so a piece of software in real life, and how you can abstract them to make them represent them suitable for machine learning processes. And of course, you know, this process, as I mentioned earlier, is the semantic gap that we need to feel. So, and basically, there are implications in the pipeline. And we'll try to actually understand what are these implications. Now, to give you, and I mentioned that all of this, you know, affect the entire machine learning pipeline. Now, to give you a very simple example is, you know, if you have a piece of software, how would you represent this piece of software? So usually when, when it comes to machine learning, you represent things in vectors, okay, vectors of numbers in general. So how would you represent this piece of software? Do you guys have any idea? You can raise your hand. Don't be shy. So say that I extract the APIs that this piece of software um, invokes over time. And I represent this in a vector of K dimension, assuming that K are the APIs that the software performs. And I use zero in a dimension of this um, vector to say that the, um, um, the software doesn't have that API or one if the software has this API. It's a way to represent a software, a piece of software with one abstraction. So the APIs that the software invokes and I represent that as a K dimensional point in a K dimensional space. Now, if you had only two dimensions, it will be like a nicely depicted in, in a usual plot that we can all understand. So this will be a point in the space. Now, is that a good representation? This is a representation. It's unclear whether it's the right representation that you can use. And it's unclear what are the implications in terms of robustness against drift and uh, adversarial manipulation, so forth and so on. So in this concept, you know, the, the point that we're trying to ask is, you know, is trustworthy AI even system security even possible? And what are the trade-offs? I mean, I guess, you know, there will not be a straight answer. It's more like, you know, there are trade-offs depending on the questions that are important for you. Um, so, okay, we'll start off with giving some uh, recap on uh, mal um, machine learning based malware classification and experimental bias, you know, to sort of set the scene and understand a bit better what I meant by abstractions and so forth and so on. Um, so let's say, and this is a very super simplified uh, pipeline, okay? So Don, take everything with a big pinch of salt. So let's say that you have an application and you analyze this application to extract some features. So either you extract features that you engineer so that you handcraft, that you prepare as a handcrafted features, like the example I've said earlier, like, you know, I want to extract all the APIs that uh, this application invokes over time. And I want to uh, represent things in a vector where each position belongs to an API and you have a zero if the API is present and one or is not present and one if it's present. Okay? It's a way to represent. Or I can learn a suitable representation, for instance, with deep learning or deep learning related approaches. Okay? Um, so I need to have some features that describe, that approximate the object that I'm working with. Then I train my classifier and let's say there's a classifier that outputs a confidence score or a probability. And if the probability is greater than 0 0.5, I can say that it is a malware, for instance. And if the, if it's less than five, I can say that it, you know, I can say it's a benign piece of software. Um, okay. This is again a simplification. We're interested in the binary classification problem where you have two classes. Now, if you want to give a little bit more terminology, when you do want to evaluate your pipeline, um, basically you need to understand whether um, you need to have a ground truth. So you need to have a labeled data set where you try to understand uh, whether your prediction is a true positive or a true negative or a false positive or a false negative. So if you have two classes, you can decide what is the positive class. And usually in malware classification task, the positive class is malware. So if the classifier outputs an object and it tells you this object is malware and you have this object in your ground truth to actually measure whether you've done right or not, and the object is a malware, then it's a true positive. So it's a positive class that is true. If on the other hand, you say that it is malware, so the classifier says there's a malware, but in your ground truth, 
the label that is associated with this piece of software is benign, it means that it's a positive classification, but it's false because it's not correct. And then you can do the same thing for the other class, for uh, the benign class. It's either a false negative, it's just misclassified, or it's a true, ne true negative if it's classified correctly. Now, once you have all of this, you can use, you can derive with true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. You can derive metrics that you can use to understand whether classifiers perform it correctly or not in a lab settings. So once you deploy the classifier, you don't have ground truth anymore. So you cannot measure this. This you can do it where you are evaluating your classifier. Now, let's try to zoom out a little bit more and see a running example that maybe can help you to understand a little bit better this approximation that I mentioned about. So instead of talking about software in this case, let's talk about Pokemons. So we do have here um, Pikachu and Charmander. Okay, These are the objects that we want to represent in a suitable way so that we can classify them uh, using a machine learning process. I'm not interested in using the state-of-the-art machine learning approach, which would require to use, because these are images, which requires to use a deep learning system, maybe a convolutional neural network. Just bear with me with a simpler approach and say that, you know, to describe these objects, my approximation is to use two features. So the height and the eye size of this element. So you see Charmander that has a bigger eye size and Pikachu is a smaller one and the height, I don't know, Charmander seems taller and Pikachu seems shorter, something like that, right? So once you, have, once you have this and you have to find your two features that again, the features either comes from domain knowledge, so it's feature engineering that you decide up front that you want to represent your object this way or this is learned through a more complex deep learning process. But whatever it is, you have your feature representation. So you represent these objects as points in a geometrical space. Okay? In this case, you have two dimensions, so that's your representation. And that's what it means that you train a classifier. It means that you try to find, for instance, in a case of a linear classifier, you're trying to find a line that separates these two classes at best. You know, you try to minimize a loss function. And the idea is actually you find this separation. Now, once you find the separation, you can test and evaluate your system because at a certain point, you will have a new testing object. You will represent this object using these two features in this case, and therefore the object will belong to a specific part in the geometric space. It's on this side, for instance, you will classify this as Charmander. It's on the other side, you classify this in, uh, as, a, as a Pikachu, okay? So that's sort of you know, the analogy with having an object and using some abstraction to represent the object. Now, this is with Pikachu, two features. Software requires more complex abstractions. They usually stems from program analysis that analyze this piece of software. It could be statically or dynamic program analysis. Now, as this, oh, well, we mentioned one thing, the security is adversarial. So things change over time. And maybe the representation that we use is not even the correct representation. So we might see things that had changed, not because the threats has actually evolved, but because the representation that we use is really brittle. It doesn't actually really help to describe the semantics that we are interested in. So you do observe drift in that case anyhow. Now, one thing that we haven't uh, mentioned is that, um, so let's say that, uh, for instance, you do have a, uh, a pipeline now, and you want to, now you have an idea and you want to evaluate this approach against um, other approaches. So you start off with what we've seen earlier that is kind of, you know, compressed in that little uh, box of features and machine learning algorithm. And I put them all together because again, either these are handcrafted features or engineer features, or they are um, learned through representation learning. And then you have the algorithm, you have a data set collection, uh, you do have some baseline approaches that you want to compare your approach against, and you use uh, what is known um, in in the literature as a k-fold cross-validation uh, uh, evaluation. Okay, and the way that this works is very simple. So you have your data set that, in this case, is made by two classes, malware and goodware. You partition the data set in k-folds of equal size, you train, you train your classifier on k minus one fold, 
and you test the classifier on the kth fold and you repeat this process kth time. The idea is to sort of have an assessment that doesn't really uh, pick a very good performance because of a lucky split. So you try to use at the same time all your da data set for training and testing, just not at the same time. Okay. Now, this is a common practice that people do. And then basically, once you've done this uh, evaluation, you can compute uh, because you have your label data, so you can compute your matrix, and then you can say, okay, now you, I have a uh, 0, 199 F1 score, and it means that my approach is actually much better than all the others, so I can publish a paper and I win. Uh, well, again, security is adversarial. So if you only evaluate this in K-fold cross-validation settings, you're basically... Um, in a way, assuming that there's no drift in your population. So you use the entire data set, knowledge that you have in the future to test something you have in the past or something you have in the past that does something that is in the future, which is fine. But you use the entire data set as to be representative of your population. So you use the entire data set to be representative of benign and malicious software in that time frame. So this actually is good and gives you a sort of approximation of performance that you might have if you don't see any drift what we said before, which is good. Sometimes you don't have drift, but eventually because you work in a security settings, you do have drift. The fourth, there are three pitfalls that you have to be careful about. So not just evaluated in this um, stationary settings, and you need also to pay attention on how you build your data set because you might introduce bias in the experimentation. And you know, I don't want to go into details in, in that, so there's some um, details about experimental bias and how you can get rid of it, some specific experimental bias in the paper that's cited in this, in this slide. But basically, as I mentioned, security is adversarial. So whenever you deploy a new system, this will trigger a reaction from attackers that would actually cause to violate IID assumptions, basically. So you can no longer just evaluate your system using K-fold cross-validation. You need also to perform a time-aware evaluation to understand how robust your system is in the presence of concept drift. And now it is important to understand what sort of you know, abstraction you're using, how you represent your software, because that would affect the rest of the pipeline. And again, to continue the, con the, the intuition about concept drift, you have to imagine that, for instance, you start out with objects that are like this. Um, so Pikachu, Charmander, and I don't remember the other guy. Um, so, and then you end up with something like this, which basically, um, those are all different uh, they're either evolution of existing classes, so like, like, you know, if you see, is it Pikachu here? This is the evolution of Pikachu. And of course, you know, if you, if the classifier classified in this class where you have the evolution of Charmander, this is a wrong prediction. Now here at the bot, at the top, you have, um, uh, Charmander, uh, that, uh, evolved into this other little, no, it's not Charmander. Sorry. This is the one I don't know. I don't remember, uh, that evolved in this one, little fella here. And if the classifier co classified there, it means the classification is correct. So the classifier was able to generalize to evolution over time. This depends on the abstraction that you have used, the, how you represented the software that you're dealing with. Okay. And in this case here, instead, this is something completely new. This is something that you haven't seen before. New behavior, new threats. So anything that you would do will likely be a mistake because the classifier has been trained on three classes. Uh, and not on any more classes. Okay, so just want to try not to tell you a little bit more concretely what are the implications of abstractions and stuff like that. Okay, so there's no straight answer. So don't don't wait for okay. This is the abstraction that you should be using when you need to represent software, because there are different ways in which you can do it, and there is a cost associated to to um, uh, working with specific abstractions. So. Program analysis is costly depending on what you need to achieve, what precision you want to achieve. Um, but there is an implication here. So in this case, for instance, I wanted to show you the effect of a specific model uh, that I named approach one again, because we are not trying to shame anyone you know, or blame anyone. But this paper was published in a top tier conference. And then we tried you know, to analyze and we tried to compare against this approach. And this actually came out as a certain DPT. So this is the first approach that I want to show you about. This is the performance that they claim in the paper. So you can see that it's uh, very close to 1.0. So it's an F1 score, I guess it was 0 
So if you have something like this, okay, I would say that's it, done, good. So it's a good job. Um, but this is evaluated in a stationary setting. So in the absence of concept drift. But we mentioned that in security, you don't have this luxury because things will evolve, things will change. Maybe the representation you used is brittle to be resistant over time to represent that specific behavior. So this is actually the real performance in table cross-validation once we remove um, some pitfall that was um, made uh, by the researcher and details are in the paper, but basically just to give you an intuition, um, we work on binary classification problems, so two classes, but the classes are imbalanced. So you have always, it's very rarely to have 50-50% of um, class ratio between malware and goodware. You always have either more goodware than malware or the other way around, depending on the problem you're looking at. Now, if you play with that class ratio at testing time, you're introducing a, an experimental bias because the class ratio at testing time should be representative of what you will observe in real life. Because if you play with that, you can tune your classifier to show very good results anyway. Um, so once we remove the experimental bias, the performance they actually, the classifier achieves in the absence of concept drift is actually a lot lower than the one that was claimed in the paper. Um, and even more, this is actually the performance, the F1 score over time. As you can see, it's quite expected to see a downward trend because you would expect that as threat evolved, you would expect that the classifier will start failing because you would expect that basically this IID assumption will start to get violated. Um, then we try to actually capture also this trend with the numbers called AUT, which is area under the time of a performance that you're interested in, so that you can quantify with a number. Say, you know, uh, the F1 score over 24 months of, um, sorry, the AUT of the F1 score over 24 months for this classifier that uses that specific feature space is 0.32. Okay. And this allows you to compare things in a more uh, consistent way. Um, now, if we compare now with two other approaches, approach two and approach three, you see that um, you have different distributions of F1 score in the absence of constant drift. So you have to look at the black and the orange line. Um, and also more interesting, you see that the down trend of the performance over time of the first classifier and the third classifier is actually much better, so they have a higher AUT than the one in the middle. Now, guess what? The one in the middle was actually published afterwards. So the one in the middle was the paper was published, um, uh, it's the most recent paper. And they compared against the other two approaches and they say they outperformed the other two approaches because they had experimental bias here and they didn't perform a correct experimental uh, time aware evaluation. Now. This approach and that approach, so approach two and approach three, they use the same feature space. So they use the same representation of the applications that they deal with. The only thing that changes is the classifier. This is a linear SVM, and this is a very simple multi-layer perception. I guess a deep learning model with one layer, hidden layer, so not so deep. But anyway, so you can see that even if the representation is the same, the implication that you have, not just in the absence of concept drift, but in the presence of concept drift, changes over time. And even if this model here, on the other hand, has a very different representation or it uses a very different algorithm and might even perform better at a certain circumstances in the absence of concept drift, you see that you have a much quicker decay over time in terms of performance. Okay? So this is, these are things, there's no clear answer here yet. This is open research, you know, what is the right uh, representation and how can we understand better which representation is correct for what we want to achieve. I only discussed about performance in the absence of concept drift and in the present concept drift. But of course, you know, another thing that we need to care about is whether we can explain uh, our performance. So, sorry, our classification. Uh, there are some feature spaces that are very, by their own nature, easy to explain with the underlying model and other that are a little bit more complex. For instance, this one, the first one and the third one, again, uh, stems from what I mentioned earlier that you have an API. So I'm oversimplifying, but basically you have a vector, a very sparse vector with zero and ones. So one is if you have an API, zero if you don't have it. 
it's a little bit more complicated than that, but you know, just this is just to give you the gist. Okay, so now that we sort of you know got into the mindset of malware-based uh, classification and what it means, what is the role of abstractions and what it means to be robust to not really robust to, to uh, concept drift, you know, but what are the effects and the implication of concept drift? The other question that we should ask ourselves, you know, is there something we can do? Because in that work before, we just show that we can measure concept drift. You know, this is how quickly the classifier, the case over time, the performance of the classifier, the case over time. And, uh, you know, but is there something that we can do about it? So, and this is um, what we're trying to be working on for the past five years, not full time. So there's something that started in 2017 as an intuition. Um, and then we sort of, you know, set it aside for a little while. And then we were assuming that a couple of years um, ago, um, with a better understanding of the theoretical underpinning of why all of this works, okay? And basically, this is the role of the, this new approach that we propose is called uh, Transcend. So basically, we equip the classifier with a rejection option. So usually, if you have a binary classification problem, you can generalize in multiple classes, but if you have a binary classification problem, you can detect, you, you can classify, for instance, cats and dogs. But if you um, have something else, of course, you know, you will make a mistake, or if you're not sure, you will make a mistake. Now, we we'll give a third option here, and in multi-class classification, we'll give a multi-class class, class one option that is a rejection option. So the intuition is that predictions that are deemed to be uncertain, really uncertain, just reject them so that you only retain predictions that would have been classified correctly. But we'll see what this entails later on, because of course the rejected points, you need to do something with it. Uh, but at least you're not trying to uh, hinder the effectiveness of the classifier. If the drift rate, so the number of applications or events that you reject over time starts increasing, then it means that you need to do something. You need to retrain. There are different options that you can, you can do. But you know, for this time being, we just focus on the option of rejecting uncertain predictions, still in the concept of um, you know, system security. So for this, we add uh, to a normal pipeline two components. One is called confirmed evaluator and the other one is called transcend. So confirmed evaluator is the statistical engine that drives a transcend rejection strategy. So it'll try to give you the intuition on how they work, this works. And um, at the end, you know, transcend basically um, emits uh, a verdict that says, you know, go ahead, accept the, the prediction or reject the prediction. So, okay, let's see how this works. Um, so first, we, we try actually with this work to understand the theoretical underpinning of why this approach works and uh, motivate the, whether it's also a practical approach. Um, before in 2017, we had this intuition, but it turns out that the approach was not really practical. And I'll tell you in a second why it was not really practical. So here we try to optimize it a little bit more to sort of, you know, see whether we could use it in real life settings. Um, we also perform different optimizations so that you can um, give, you can obtain different guarantees depending on your operational settings. And also, differently from the 2017 work, we try to uh, show how generalizable the approach was uh, when working on different domains and using different algorithms. So, for instance, we explored Android malware classification. Windows malware classification and PDF malware classification. So different domains, different objects represented in different ways uh, with different algorithms. I guess, you know, we explore uh, linear SVM and three like uh, classification algorithms. Um, okay, so we mentioned that uh, Confirm Evaluator is the statistical engine that drives uh, transcends rejection strategies. And this stems from Confirm Prediction Theory. Now, Confirm Prediction Theory, um, is something it's a it's something that allows you to um, associate uh, to give a confidence level to a prediction and there is with a guarantee so basically there is a guarantee that your prediction will be correct given a specific confidence level that you want to set up from um, this works but you can see this in a different way so given the significance level, so an error that you're willing to accept, you have a guarantee that your prediction is correct modulo that error. 
And this is all with guarantees and this conform a prediction theory. And um, there are only two assumptions. One is a generalization of IID. So just think about IID as we described earlier. So this is an assumption. So if you don't have that, confirm data doesn't work. And closed word settings. So in closed word settings, it means simply that if you train your classifier, for instance, with labels of cats and dogs, at test time, you cannot provide a rabbit as a label. So closed word, it means that you cannot give uh, a different label space than the one that you train your classifier with. These are the only two uh, assumptions that conform a predictor requires. Now, let's see a little bit more of the intuition, how it works. So confirm a predictor, and I'll give you, you know, how this connects with confirm evaluator. So confirm a predictor rel relies on um, a measure that's called non-conformity measure. The non-conformity measure is derived by the decision function of the classifier. So it's really intertwined with the classifier that you're using. You could say that it's agnostic to the classifier in the sense, you know, that it works for any classifier because you just need to define the right non-conformity measure that stems from the decision function of the classifier. And this measure basically captures, gives a score of how dissimilar each example is with respect to all the other examples for a given class. It capture, captures a level of dissimilarity. Um, for instance, here, you can see that this is a, a polynomial SVM. So you can see that the decision boundary is just, you know, this, uh, you know, um, curve over here. And these other two parts here, these are the margin. Don't forget about the margin. So just imagine that instead of having a straight line, like I showed earlier in, with the plot, you just have something that's a bit more polynomial, it's a bit more complex than that. So here, the decision function, so the non-community measure stems from this decision function. And the blue area identify all the points that are more dissimilar to the test object that you have here represented with um, a red star with respect to the, to the points of the black class. Okay, and then we try to capture, we, we try to quantify this with, uh, uh, so we try to give a statistical support to this measure by introducing a p-value that captures, it's a ratio between the more dissimilar points or so less similar points over all the other points. And this is a value that goes from zero to one. And we do this in a liberal condition way, which means that we do this for every class. So every prediction, every points that you have in your data set will have a p-value for it the good class and the p-value for the bad class. And every testing object will have a p-value for the good class and for the bad class, okay? Uh, so this to capture the statistical support that you want to have. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this generalizes across different classifiers. So this is just an example of different non-conformity measures for different classifiers, okay? According to the decision function that you chose up front. Now, don't have to look at all of them, but just to say that, you know, this doesn't work necessarily just on SVM. It works on any sort of classifier you can think of. Um, now, this other concept is quite interesting, and this is the connection that we make between confirmed predictors and evaluators. So confirmed predictors again makes predictions. So here you can think of a p-value as a statistical support to your prediction. Now, do you remember that we mentioned earlier that confirmed predictor gives you guarantees given a fixed significance level, epsilon that you choose. Now let's look at the extreme. Let's say that you don't want to have any mistake. So your epsilon is zero, and therefore you are at the far end of this line, which means that the classifier, the only way for the classifier to give you a guarantee that your prediction is correct is to output a prediction set that contains the entire label space, right? Because that's the only way. If I need to give you a guarantee that your prediction is correct, I can only output a prediction set that gives you two labels, malware and goodware. Then at that point, under the assumption of IID and of closed word, my prediction is correct. Now on the other side, if, you, if, you're, um, uh, if you're willing to, um, to withstand any possible error, you can go to the other side, so epsilon is one. And at that point, because you can, you can sustain any error, then the classifier prediction, confirm prediction, emits the empty set. Because at that point, you will have for sure error. Now, what is interesting is something that you have in between. Of course, you know, because if for every prediction, I emit you always the label space, I say, oh, this is either good or malware. Okay. Well, good job, but it's not really useful for me. So what is interesting is perhaps, this is actually useful if you have multi-label, like, you know, many, many labels, of course, because if you have 
um, you know, thousands of labels and your prediction set is, is down to a handful of labels with a guarantee of given a specific confidence level, then it's actually good. But in the binary classification settings, this is not actually good. So what we're interested in is something that is sandwiched in between these two different regions. So, so whenever you have a prediction set that contains only one label. And at that point, you can identify a specific confidence level that corresponds to that point. So a predictor builds two metrics out of these p-values. One is called credibility, which is the class with the highest p-value, and confidence, which is one minus, minus the second best option. So one minus the p-value of the other class. So ideally, just intuitively, just follow me here without looking at the deals. Intuitively, for a prediction, you like to have a super high credibility and a super high confidence, which means that the second option that I have has a very low p-value. If I have that, then I can be quite certain that my prediction is correct. That's according to the, uh, of course, you know, the, uh, the assumptions that the algorithm requires. Now, however, we don't use for a predictor here because we don't really care about making a prediction and giving you a prediction with the right confidence because that works with two assumptions, IID and closed word. But when dealing with drift, the, those are the assumptions that you violate, so you cannot get those guarantees anymore. We use the same statistical reasoning to evaluate the quality of the prediction. And at that point, basically, um, for us, a low credibility means that there's a high probability of an impossible result. So this means that the assumption, so there is a high probability of observing a drifting point. Um, and now, basically, the next step is uh, to try to understand how can I use this information. And uh, here you just need to understand that basically the intuition is that now that you do have p values for all the points in your data set, there is a calibration phase in which you evaluate correct predictions and incorrect predictions. And then you solve an optimization problem that tries actually to find suitable per class thresholds that are representative of your um, data set. Now at test time, if something belongs if a prediction belongs above of uh, one of the, above the threshold of the predicted class then you accept the prediction if the prediction belongs below this quality threshold you reject the prediction and of course you know to identify this suitable threshold there's an optimization problem that requires to set you know to satisfy some constraints that are either expressed in terms of performance that you want to achieve or drift rate you're willing to tolerate this is if you observe things in a non-drifting scenario. Say that from the next day you deploy your classifier and all the data you observe is drifting, you would expect the classifier to reject everything. And that's correct because it would make a mistake otherwise. Um, so what you can do with the rejected points is out of scope for, the work, for this work. We have sort of, you know, tried to experiment with um, online learning, but there's a risk of self-poisoning the classifier. But there is something that we're still working on nowadays in terms of forecasting drift, like, you know, where drift is going to go. Um, but there, of course, you know, there are different options you can follow. You can do incremental retraining. You can do online learning. You can use active learning. I'm trying to give you some uh, terminology to, you know, you can have a look at that uh, to try to, reboost the performance of the classifier. All of this requires to label the points that you reject. And there is a cost associated with that. So ideally, you, you'd like to limit that cost as much as possible. So all the research now has been devoted to be working around that um, issue. Okay, now, and I'm just check on, check on time. Um, okay, almost done. So basically, uh, if you remember, we compute p-values and then we found, find these suitable thresholds that these will be our rejection thresholds. Now, how do we find, um, um, how do we find these thresholds? I mentioned that this is done in a, in a calibration phase, but how is it actually done, uh, specifically? The original work, um, derives from, again, from predictor theory and it's called transductive conformal evaluator. So the idea here is that you build a p-value for all the points that you have in your data set in a leave one out fashion. What does this mean? You take one point of the data point, you set it aside, you train your classifier on all the other points, and then you build a non-conformity score. As we mentioned earlier, we build the p-value and everything. Okay. Now, that point that you took away has a p-value. Now, you put this point back into your training data set, you take the second point and you take it out. 
you redo all the training and you build the non-conformity score, the p-value, and you give a p-value to the second point. You do this for the third point and so forth and so on. What is the intuition here? Now, you don't want that. So what is the effect here? The effect is that you, if you have a data set of k points, you're training k classifiers because every time you take one point out, you do this for the entire data set. What you want to achieve is that, you remember that before in the very simplified Pikachu, Charmander picture, you have a line that separates the two classes. Okay? Now imagine that I take one of those points out and I retrain the classifier. I don't want this line to change. Or if it changes, just slightly. Okay? Because I'm building some statistical support for all my data set. If this line changes too much, the non-conformity score that I build that is derived by this decision function changes completely for any arbitrary point in my data set. So I'm not building a statistical support that can help me in my role. So I want this line to change, not at all, but just very slightly. That's why if I do this in a leave one out fashion, it works because the chances if you have a large data, a large data set, you take one point out, that point influences very little decision boundary. It's not practical. Because if you have a large data set, you can now really train K classifiers. So the second approach, in, um, but this is rooted in this confirmed predictor theory. So at least you have guarantees here, but it's not practical. Already with the data set that we have now that I ran the experiments with, you cannot use transductive confirmed evaluator because it's too costly. So we propose something that tries to approximate transductive confirmed evaluator. So the idea is still the same. Instead of leaving one point out, we leave a batch of point out. The larger the batch, the fewer classifiers you need to train. So now my leave one out is made of 10 points. The problem is that this, of course, you know, lowers the cost of, um, of running, of building the statistical support because you need to train now not K classifier, but K divided the size of the batch that you choose. But there's no guarantee. So th this is not rooted in confirmed predicting theory. There's no guarantee that the batch size that you take doesn't change the decision boundary. You would need to verify what is the right batch size that doesn't change that. And it's a little bit complicated. So, but there are two other options that we uh, were able to borrow from the confirmed predictor theory. One is called inductive confirm evaluator and the other one is called cross confirm evaluator. So in the inductive confirm evaluator, you split the data set in a proper training, which is the great part. And you train the classifier using that data set. You train only one. And then, you use the other part, the, the calibration data set, to build the p-values of um, your point. It's efficient. It's rooted in the confirmed predicting theory. It's um, informationally inefficient because you lose data that uh, comes from the gray points there. So you lose the statistical support that comes from those points. Um, so there is something in between that tries actually to ameliorate this. And it's called cross-conformal evaluator. So you have to imagine, so this is kind of a borrowed as an idea from cross validation. So you partition your data set in K folds and you run K inductive confirm evaluator. So what I just described earlier, you do this K time uh, across your data set. So it's a kind of, you know, trade off between the two because it's a little bit more computationally intensive, but you use the entire data set to build out this statistical support. Um, okay, so let's see how all of this works. Um, we have, uh, so this is a bit of statistics on the data set. So we have um, roughly 260,000 applications um, from January 2014 to December 2018. Um, we use as a feature space and a feature engineering something that we still consider to be state of the art. So Drabin, you were involved in Drabin already? We're not, still okay. It's a great paper anyway. So. Um, so here, basically, we, as I mentioned earlier, it's an oversimplification, but just imagine that you've given an application, you extract all the APIs, and uh, you build a vector of k dimensions, if k is the number of APIs that you can see in your data set, zero if the API is not in that uh, example, one if it's in the example. So you have a binary feature space, which is very sparse, um, and it works fairly well. It's very simple, very light with static analysis, whether it's the right representation, we don't know, it certainly works if you're concerned about some performance and um, some level of robustness against uh, drift. 
uh, classifier underneath is a linear SVM. So something very similar to what I show with the Pikachu images, like you know, with the linear separate. It's slightly more complex than that, but you know, that gives you the idea. Then we have uh, another data set, uh, Windows PE applications. So 170,000 applications uh, uh, covers two years worth of data. Um, the Ember, the, the feature space is according to Ember, which extract different features statically from disarmed uh, disassembly version of the malware. So the Zamina says you cannot run it. It's something missing. You can rearm it to execute it. But it's a feature representation. Is it the correct one? We don't know, but we don't really care that much at that moment. So we just wanted to evaluate how um, this affects, uh, uh, how this is affected by concentrate. And the algorithm is a gradient boosted decision tree. Just think about decision tree algorithm. Okay. Um, and then PDF. So we have also experience on PDF on a data set called Hedost, uh, with 100, roughly 190,000 applications that cover a couple of months. Uh, the algorithm is a random forest, uh, and the features have been handcrafted, but they have been handcrafted to be robust to drift. So what we would be hoping to see is not a decay in the performance of the classifier if the feature space is robust to drift. We would hope to see a more steadier performance over time, because the features in that case captures the semantics of the objects that you're trying to look at. Um, now, I don't have the pictures of those in the presentation, too much stuff, but you know, you can look at the paper. So, and I had it actually, or maybe I have it as a backup slide, but I don't know if it's surviving the PDF export. Sorry, I can show it maybe later on. Um, and then we had also the thresholding optimization and this we chose some operational uh, parameters in terms of we would like to achieve a 0 0.9 F1 score in non-drifting scenarios. And we would like to keep the rejection rate at 15% at most in non-drifting scenarios. Okay. So this is the errors we're willing to tolerate given that performance we would like to achieve. If everything that we see drifts, of course, you know, the drift rate would just increase to 100%, but that's expected because it means the classifier rejected all the applications. Now, the question is, if the classifier would reject the, the predictions that would be misclassified, if this is the case, then it's a good classification uh, with rejection option because you're rejecting things that you would have made mistake on. Okay, let's see um, how this behaves. Now, this is the performance um, using approximate TC. You remember that approximation is not live one out, but we do like in live one out with batches. Um, and we divide the entire data set. So this is for Android. Um, they had, uh, how many? Uh, 260,000. So we have uh, 26,000 uh, apps per fold. So it means that our batches include 26,000 apps. Now, do we have a guarantee that when you do this and you retrain the classifier, the decision boundary doesn't change? No, like we can check, but there's no guarantee. This is approximate to see. Okay. Still, in this case, Okay, the line, how to read this plot. So the dashed gray line, this one here, is the baseline. So this is the performance of the classifier in the presence of concentrate. Like, this is a normal classifier, will give you an app to give you an output, malware or goodware. That's it. And there will be mistakes. And the mistakes are reflected by the performance that keeps on decreasing over time. Okay, this is expected, right? There's it, you can see there is a downward trend, which is what you would expect. Now, you might ask yourself why there's no smooth downward trend. Well, this is real, sorry, this is real data. So some of the things we observe will be in distribution and you'll have, you'll have like, you know, from here, you go back here, you have a sort of a spike and some other things will be out of distribution. Uh, it's a real data, so we cannot control that. Um, what is interesting is to look at the blue line, which is the F1 score. Okay, just a note. Disregard the spinal part here. You see that it drops dramatically because we have fewer data there. So we make many mistakes. Just disregard that part. But basically for the blue line, you see that this is the boost in performance over time that we, we have once we deploy transcend rejection option. So the blue line is the performance, the F1 score of the, um, application that you accept, so of the prediction that you accept. Now the question is, how about what is the performance of the application that you reject? If the performance of the application you reject is 
low, it's good because you have rejected things that you would have misclassified. If the performance of what you reject is high, it means that you haven't done a really good job. So the performance of the app that we reject is zero. So here we are rejecting all the apps that we would have had, that we would have misclassified. Could have we rejected more apps? Perhaps, but we didn't. So the, the system uh, didn't um, catch those. So that's why you still see that it's not a steady 0 0.99 line here. So it still goes up and down a little bit. But compared to the baseline, it's a big improvement. Now, what is the cost to pay this histogram here, the gray histogram? So these are the drift rates. So the application that you have rejected per, in that time unit. One thing that I haven't mentioned is that we train the classifier with a year worth of data, and you observe here 46 months uh, of testing time window okay, to see how this works over time. And there are a couple of other interesting metrics in terms of AUT that I mentioned earlier. The AUT for the F1 on the accepted objects is 82, and on the one on the rejected is zero, which is, which is good. It's very good. And the CPU hours to do all of this for transcend, like for calibrating and building the p-values and everything is 46 hours on that 260,000 applications. This doesn't account for the feature engineering. So that is a cost that is um, still you need to incur. So it's your abstraction, your representation. If you would have gone with something more complex, sure, you might have had better results, but there's a cost that that incurs that you need to take care of. Um, now the next point is to see the performance with uh, IC, which is rooted in the um, confirmed predictor theory. You see that um, it's a little bit worse in some aspect with respect to the other one, but it's kind of you know similar trend. Even sometimes perform even better. The drift rate uh, increases a little bit more here towards the end, which is what you would expect because as time progresses, more things will be drifting. Um, still, interesting thing is that the rejected AUT is still zero. So again, we have just rejected things that we would have misclassified. Maybe we could have rejected more, but again, do you remember the IC is informationally inefficient because we use only some part of our data set to build statistical support. That's why it's something we pay for it. Ideally, we should be using the transductive confirm evaluator. So all the data set and then leave one out. That's the best option, but you can't use it because you cannot really generalize. Approximate DC in this case works okay, but there's no guarantee that this will work on a different data set with a different batch size. So. IC is what is rooted in the theory, and you should be using either this or, sorry, or cross confirm evaluator. So, so cross confirm evaluator, you see it's a lot better in terms of performance of accepted elements. So way better than the others, more conservative, but you start paying some price here because you start rejecting uh, application that the classifier would have classified correctly. So there's always a trade-off. So in all of these things, there's no a winner, a clear, a clear winner. Um, but you see also in terms of IUT and uh, CPU hours that two things are quite different. So cross-confirm evaluator, of course, is less information and inefficient than the other part. But of course, because you do this in a valid, in a, in a cross faction, you don't do this, you don't gather all this information all together like you would have done with transductive confirm evaluator, the first approach, for instance. Okay. So one can ask ourselves, so we could ask ourselves, hey, many classifiers actually output probabilities. Can we actually use probabilities straight away instead of doing all of this stuff? We use probabilities. We have to still build the same, you know, same fashion, transductive, inductive, cross-conformal, blah, 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 um, because we want to have, at the end of the day, we want to have, um, we want to identify thresholds per class thresholds that we can enforce? Um, sure, that's a valid question. And this is what we also try to evaluate. Um, and uh, so this is again a summary of how things perform uh, using Transcend. And this is actually what happens with probabilities. Now Transcend uses statistical support to build per class thresholds. Probabilities most of the times are not calibrated, so they're skewed. Whenever something is good or bad, it doesn't mean that you have the specific ratio to support your decision. Um, so they are skewed. And this is where basically you can see this reflected here that it's basically all over the place. Like you start rejecting things, but you would have classified these things correctly. So you see that 
these two lines are too close or too overlapping to be useful in a certain way. Um, so you can you can't really use uh, priorities for doing this. Okay, so wrapping up because I guess that we went over time a little bit. Let me just double check. Two minutes over time. Yes, I'm wrapping up. So, so um, what I believe it will be important to see uh, now working on. So we explored at the very beginning in 2019, something related to experimental bias in classification. And we found out that actually it's important to take care of nuances of applied machine learning in security context, because otherwise numbers that you see might actually be inflated. And uh, it is important that you believe at least that you've done all your best for sound methodology. And um, that work was a kind of, you know, um, wake up call, uh, also on things that we have been doing. So we're part of the community. We made mistakes as well. Um, and that worked a little bit, you know, broadened up and generalized more in something that we worked uh, with uh, Chris, um, Kit, and uh, um, KCL when it was still KCL now, UCL, and uh, um, folks that also at um, uh, Two Branchwijk, so it's um, main research group there. And uh, we sort of you know, generalized this in, in something that we summarized as do's and don'ts of machine learning and computer security. So there are 10 different pitfalls uh, and we present them with case study, with analysis, with prevalence in the past uh, 20 years, I guess, uh, of study. And we um, try to also provide evidence of how these pitfalls might invalidate results um, in different applications or for different tasks all around. So it's very important that we start becoming aware that some of this, um, some of machine learning applying security concepts uh, requires uh, some specific uh, attention. Um, some of the problems, some of the pitfalls are still open problem nowadays, but at least we should be open and discuss them as limitations of current work. Um, then something else that we are, guys, do, the animation here were actually amazing, but you know, I haven't done the animations. Fergus Pendlebury, so it's, former PhD student of mine, were amazing, really. Anyway, so another thing that we are exploring is universal adversarial perturbation. So I haven't had a chance to talk to you about adversarial machine learning too much, but there is a connection between drift and adversarial manipulation. So you can think about adversarial machine learning as a worst case drift, for instance. And we've done some work in the past, uh, in 2020, on uh, input-specific adversarial machine learning attacks in the problem space. So what it means to actually make this work not just in the abstraction that you choose, but at the end of the day, um, in a real piece of software. So what does it mean to create an adversarial attack, an attack that breaks a machine learning system, but at the same time creates an object that exists in the real world? So if you're manipulating a malware, well, you still want to have a real malware that you want to execute, and the malware still has to preserve the semantics, but at the same time, you want that to break the machine learning system. Um, we try to generalize this and explore universal adversarial perturbations. Instead of having perturbation that applied specifically on individual input, we wanted to sort of identify a blueprint of pocket of vulnerabilities in the uh, machine learning models. Um, now to show you know how brittle they are, but our idea is to use this to harden the system, so as a defense later on. Um, something else we're working on is, um, so we've done things in at test time, so adversarial machine learning at test time, we reformulated this in the concept of problem space, rel realizable attacks. We also explore backdoors attacks in collaboration with UIC, um, for the why. Um, we're also working on, try to work on abstractions that give you robust features, because if fe features are robust against manipulation, it means that should be more robust against drift and more robust against adversarial manipulation. Um, we also have been working on drift detection, of course, as I mentioned, we've been doing something uh, around online learning on how, you know, once you have rejected points, what can you do with that? And one way is actually to use those points to sort of, you know, retrain your system um, uh, online, in an online fashion. This is a little bit tricky because if the pseudo labels you're using, so if the prediction you're using, you're using straight away and the prediction is, cor is incorrect, you risk of poisoning your model. So, but what we're really working on nowadays is something that is 
even more than that. So we're trying to forecast where drift is going to go. Instead of reacting to drift, like we transcend that you, you detect when things are drifting away and you reject them, we would like to actually anticipate where drift is going to go. So we would like to change the decision boundary of an algorithm up front, um, trying to see, to hope to see where drift is likely going to go and therefore withstand drift for a little longer time. So it means that, you know, in that time window, you should have similar performance with a little bit less uh, drift rate. So a little bit less uh, rejected applications. And, uh, and also we're trying to work on, remember that before I said, you know, all of this requires abstractions and the way that you present objects and blah, blah, blah. And all of this affects the entire pipeline in all sorts of different ways. And there are costs associated with it. So what we're trying to do now is also trying to, whether we can describe behaviors or more specifically semantics of softwares. Instead of defining simple features that might work for the task, but they do not solve the task, we're trying actually to see whether we can get as close as possible to this platonic ideal of behaviors. And at that point, not just saying that something is good or bad, but also giving more information about something. So this application does that or that. So explaining a little bit the behavior there. And um, that's pretty much it. So um, this is how just what the AI for system security may look like. And there's a lot more um, in the space. So thank you.